Okay, everybody, we're about to start. Welcome. Welcome to a Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. It's fun to be here looking out these bright windows. It's always a great view out our windows. A little bit about future speakers. So you were thinking that the Mojave was a desert, but in fact, the Mojave used to be a lake, and we'll hear all about that uh, in December from Michael Ellis, the noted naturalist, who talk all about um, the lake that turned into a desert. Uh, and it's fascinating, his whole history of the region. Um, and then in uh, November 20th, Dick Carter, the naval architect, self-trained naval architect who invented the trim tab. Who knows what a trim tab is? Okay, imagine, it's very significant uh, racing enhancement uh, in hull design. The guy who invented that, he'll be here to talk all about uh, that and his other adventures. He's got a new book out. And then next week, Jim Shine, who has Shine and Shine maps in North Beach. Very cool ancient map um, store. And if you want to learn all about the beginnings of San Francisco, you look at his, go to his map store. Because as we all know, uh, San Francisco has been filled in. 6% of San Francisco has been added by people shoving dirt into the water. A long time ago, 150 years ago, people bought water rights. Uh, in fact, Mission Bay, which is a big medical development, was actually a bay in those days. Mission Creek came down and emptied out into it. He'll show you the evolution of San Francisco as seen from a bird's eye view top topographically. Also, the same thing happened with other cities in California on the coast, and it's a fascinating, fascinating talk. And now a little bit about our speaker today. So as you know, to do 50 talks a year, um, we have now got a network of incredibly interesting people who pass along speaker suggestions. And now there's even a bit of a network in the Bay Area. That is to say there's somebody who has a Sauce Leader Speakers Program. There's someone who has a Corinthian Yacht Club Speakers Program. And we all kind of collaborate with each other and, and suggest names of good speakers to each other. And today's speaker came from the chairperson of the San Francisco Yacht Club, our parent club. Our, the San Francisco Yacht Club's speaking uh, series, speaker series, and our speaker today will speak at that series again tonight. So say thank you very much to Mo Roddy and her boyfriend, Don Wynicky. Thank you, Mo. Wonderful. Um, so, you know, our speaker has these multiple lives. All of us have fascinating tangents. Um, and you can look at her from her sailing environment, and you can look at her from her um, medical environment and her criminal environment. But it wouldn't be a great, a great head table if we didn't have someone else from Rhode Island here. So we had Bruce Stone joined the table. Bruce Stone, great racer, and at this point guilty of being from Rhode Island. That's as close to incriminating cases we can make. Uh, but also Don and Mo brought their friends that they've spent a bunch of time cruising with. So. Um, uh, we want to introduce Bruce and Nora. Say hello, Bruce and Nora. And I'm happy to bring longtime friends, um, Joe Fink, one-time president, former president of the uh, Dominican University, and his dear bride and dear friend, Denise. So Joe and Denise, thank you for coming. Real fun to have you guys here. So um, I mentioned the multiple strains of everybody's life. Our speaker today got on a sail, a sunfish when she was 25, so not a childhood sailor, but she was immediately bitten by it. And um, she would abuse herself sailing uh, off and on for the rest of her days, including at one point buying a, uh, a 420 from Mr. Bemis himself, i.e. the Bemis Trophy, um, you know, then after which the Bemis Trophy was named. She, she bought also a J30. She ended up buying J30 number 100, the first J30. And she cruised it and raced it and did all manner of racing uh, in, uh, you know, uh, Connecticut and in that area. And she started going to, and she went to school in New York City, went, uh, started, lived in a suburb up the Hudson. And then I went to Barnard and then uh, got her medical degree and ultimately found herself to Rhode Island. And once she's in Rhode Island, you know, when you're in Rhode Island, you automatically know that you're in a very, very, very special place. And so she had this most fascinating career from which she wrote a book and you all get to come up here and buy a book, uh, which she'll uh, sign for you and so on. Um, and so 
when we listen to her today, what we have is a very thoughtful sailor who's also a doctor and just for the heck of it, a mistress to the mob. So with no more introduction than that, please welcome Barbara Roberts. <laughs> So thank you for that uh, kind introduction, Ron. And I also want to thank Don and Mo for um, helping arrange this talk. And I want to thank all of you for coming out on this lovely day uh, to hear about my lurid past as a mob doctor and a mob mistress. Now, if you were to take a creative writing course, who would be the least likely person in the world to ever become involved with the mafia, you might invite someone with my kind of background. Because I was raised as the oldest of 10 children in a devout Catholic family. My parents were part of the Catholic worker movement. They were followers of the radical Catholic pacifist Dorothy Day. And with some of my father's friends, they decided to form what was basically a left-wing Catholic commune. It was a community of like-minded Catholics, which they called Mary Crest, after the Blessed Virgin Mary, of course. And because they didn't want their children to be exposed to the temptations of the big city, the big city in this case being New York. So they pooled their meager resources and they bought 52 acres of land. Still hear you want to see. Okay, okay. 52 acres of land in what was then called the country and is now called the suburbs, in a, outside a little town called Pearl River. And even though, though they knew nothing about building houses, they all chipped in and helped build houses. And they were very devout Catholics. We were raised to be saints, preferably martyrs, because if you died for your faith, you went straight to heaven, you bypassed purgatory, you bypassed hell, no matter how many mortal sins you had committed. My father's favorite expression was rally around your priests blindly. There was a plaque on our dining room wall, and the plaque read, Christ is the head of this house, the unseen host at every meal the silent listener to every conversation. Talk about Big Brother, right? <laughs> and as I mentioned, I was the oldest in a family of 10 children. My mother had 10 children in 10 years and three months, one of whom died, and then she had a four-year break. And when I was 15, my youngest brother, Mark, was born. Now, when we initially moved to Marycrest, and we were the first family to move there, we had no electricity. We had a little generator that ran the water pump. Um, and we were attending a local Catholic school, which was all, also an orphanage. And for the first few years, my mother's widowed twin sister and her son, my cousin Bernie, came with us and lived with us before my aunt remarried. But once my aunt remarried when I was eight years old, I became like the co-mother. In fact, from the age of eight, when my mother went into the hospital every year to have the baby, I was taken out of school and I would stay home and take care of all my younger siblings, do all the cooking, all the cleaning, all the ironing. And it became apparent to me at a very young age that my mother's life was extraordinarily difficult. Money was in very short supply. My father worked as a freight solicitor for a railroad and on the weekends he typed up patent applications for a patent attorney. And as the family grew and our poverty increased, he descended into alcoholism. And I realized that I wanted to have a life as far removed from my mother's as it was possible to get. 
Now, my father worshipped priests and doctors, and I knew I didn't have a prayer of becoming a priest. So, <laughs> so I decided that I was going to become a doctor at a time when girls who said they were going to become doctors were looked at askance. So after 12 years of Catholic school, I had decided as a senior in high school that I was going to follow in the footsteps of a friend of mine who had also announced she was going to be a doctor. And I knew that I have a much better chance of being accepted into medical school at a time when there were quotas for women. No class could be more than 10% women. I knew I'd have a better chance of getting accepted if I went to a prestigious university, not some Catholic girls college where my father wanted me to go. So I told my father that I wanted to go to Barnard College. Now he was all in favor of me going to college because he had drummed that into me from a young age. You must go to college and you must win a scholarship because I can't afford the tuition. But he absolutely refused to sign the application to Barnard. But luckily, a very dear friend of my parents was the chaplain of the Newman Club at Columbia University in Barnard's the Women's College at Columbia, Father Edwin Duffy. And I called Father Duffy and I pleaded with him to convince my father to sign my application to Barnard. So Father Duffy uh, told my father that I wouldn't necessarily become a communist if I went to Barnard. <laughs> so my father signed the application. I went to Barnett on scholarship. They had something called professional option. And if you completed all your major requirements in three years and got accepted to medical school as a junior, Barnett would count your first year of medical school as a senior year of college. And during my college years, I met and fell in love with the big Columbia football star of that era, a man by the name of Archie Roberts. And Archie was a star quarterback. And when he, he was also a very good baseball player. And when he was a senior and I was a freshman in medical school, he was actually recruited by both uh, professional football and uh, professional baseball teams. But the best deal he got, because he wanted to combine somehow medical school and football, was from the Cleveland Browns. The Cleveland Browns had drafted the Heisman Trophy winner by the name of Ernie Davis. And Ernie Davis went out to Cleveland, but before he could play for the Browns, he developed leukemia. And he was cared for by Dr. Austin Weisberger, who was a hematologist, who was also the chief of medicine at Case Western Reserve. So Art Modell, who was the owner of the Cleveland Browns at that time, became very good friends with the dean of the medical school, Jack Coy, and with Austin Weisberger, who was the hematologist. So they worked out a deal where my husband, my then husband, would be on the reserve squad for the first two years. He'd go away to football camp, but he wouldn't have to take time off from class until his junior year when he would have some elective time. The medical school actually said you can use your elective time to play football. Go figure. Um, <laughs> so, but when his third year came around, he was traded to the Miami Dolphins. I went down there. I did my clerkships. But the Cleveland Browns paid us a salary. So I say I'm the only woman who ever went to medical school on a football scholarship. <laughs> so after my internship year, uh, Archie graduated, and we both went to Yale New Haven for a few years. It was the height of the Vietnam War, and all male doctors were being drafted, and most were being sent to Vietnam. Now, if you were a woman in those days and you had children under the age of 18, and in the meantime, I had had two children, you couldn't even join the armed forces if you wanted to. But Archie was very lucky. He got a draft deferred position in the public health service. These guys who were lucky enough to get those positions were called yellow berets, as opposed to the green berets. So, but what happened to me during my medical school, particularly that rotation in Miami where I did my OBGYN was I saw things that really radicalized me. I saw women, this was before Roe v. Wade, before abortion was legal. I saw women come into the emergency room with perforated wombs, with their bowels hanging out of their vaginas. I knew of a woman who died because she was, a, she was denied a therapeutic abortion 
when she was pregnant, despite the fact that she had end-stage heart disease and end-stage liver disease. Plus, you know, my first daughter was unplanned. I had uh, been on the pill but developed complications, so I had started using birth control. And for a devout Catholic to use birth control, I, I basically felt I had to leave the church. When we were residents at Yale, I was moonlighting at Yale Student Health, and I met many of the Yale, the female Yale law students, and they told me they were bringing a class action suit against the Connecticut abortion laws. Again, this is before Roe v. Wade. So I wound up being the medical coordinator for that lawsuit and being asked to speak about abortion all over Connecticut. So I did a, a, an elective rotation to learn how to do first trimester abortions, and then we went to the NIH. And by then I had also become active in the anti-war movement. It was the height of the anti-war movement. But my increasing feminism and radicalization put a tremendous strain on my marriage. Archie wanted me to be the obedient, compliant, docile Catholic girl he married, and I had become a raving feminist. And I wanted him to do half the housework. I wanted him to do half the childcare. Fat chance, right? So to make a long story short, and you can read all about it in the book, we wound up getting divorced. And at the end of two years at the NIH, I moved to Rhode Island. I'm so, no, yes, no, I moved, to, I moved to Boston to do my cardiology fellowship. And when I was in Boston was when I bought my 420. And I, I didn't campaign it, but I used to sail it on the weekends just to relax. After two years, um, well, while I was at Boston, I'm already divorced from Archie. We have two children. The children are with me. And in Boston, I hired uh, a male babysitter. And we wound up becoming romantically involved. As he says, I was promoted from babysitter to lover. And at the end of my fellowship, he came with us to my first job out of fellowship, which was on the full-time faculty at Penn State's medical school. And we had a daughter while we were in Pennsylvania. But he, much like my father, became a very uh, serious alcoholic. He also, you know, had uh, drug issues. And so by the time we moved to Rhode Island, which we did in 1977, that relationship was on the skids. Although he told me, if you ever break up with me, I will make the rest of your life miserable. And I did break up with him shortly after moving to Rhode Island, and then he began this campaign of harassment. But anyway, um, so I moved to Rhode Island. I have three little children. I'm a single mother. I'm in private practice. I'm the first female adult cardiologist in the state of Rhode Island. And cardiologists refer, uh, rely on referrals from other doctors for patients. And I would attend the weekly heart catheterization conference at my hospital. There, you know, a heart catheterization is that diagnostic procedure. And one day there was one of the older cardiologists who was very bombastic and he was holding forth and saying what he thought should happen to this patient that had just been presented. And I disagreed with him and I was very outspoken about disagreeing with him and he did not take that too kindly. And I just held my ground. So this cardiac surgeon in, who's at the conference turned to the nurse next to him and said, who is that woman? She said, oh, that's Dr. Barbara Roberts. She's the new cardiologist in town. And Bob said, that woman has balls. <laughs> and he started referring me patients. And one of the patients he referred to me was the father of the premier criminal defense attorney in Rhode Island, a guy by the name of Jack Cicilline. And Jack's father had a massive heart attack at an outlying hospital in southern Rhode Island. And by the time he was transferred to the Miriam Hospital, where I practiced, the damage had been done. And there really wasn't very much we could do for him. But he did live six weeks. And though, during those six weeks, I became very friendly with this lawyer, Jack Cicilline, his wife, his five children, his brothers, his sister, and a lot of his friends. And one of his friends was a guy by the name of Raymond Jr. Patriarca. And Jr. was the only son of Raymond Patriarca Sr., who had been the alleged head of the New England Mafia since the 1950s. 
And Junior and I became friendly, and he told me that he was very unhappy with the care his father was getting. His father had been diabetic since the 1940s. His father had had a heart attack in the 1960s, during which he was cared for by Dr. Paul Dudley White. Some of you may remember that Paul Dudley White took care of President Eisenhower when he had his heart attack. So I knew that anyone who's been diabetic for almost 40 years and has an almost 20 year history of coronary artery disease is likely to be quite ill. And, and when Junior asked me to see his father as a patient, I said, of course, as far as I knew, he was living quietly at home. His father, Raymond Sr., was living quietly at home with his second wife, his first wife having died of cancer, his second wife, Rita O'Toole, patriarcha. And I said to Junior, just call my office and make an appointment, which he did. But before that appointment could take place, Raymond developed a gangrenous toe. Raymond Sr. developed a gangrenous toe. He was admitted by my cardiac surgeon friend, Dr. Robert Andalia, to Fatima Hospital, where he had a toe amputation. So I said to Junior, don't worry. Just when your father's discharged from the hospital, call my office and we'll reschedule his appointment. So I had already agreed to take care of his father. Well, within a few days of being discharged from that admission for an amputation, uh, a Providence police officer and a state police officer show, officer show up at Raymond's home and arrest him on charges of accessory and conspiracy to murder based on an informant's testimony. And Raymond was so upset that even though he took his insulin, he couldn't finish eating his dinner and he forgot to bring his nitroglycerin. Now, I happened to be in Jack's office, Jack Cicilline's office, because Jack and his brother were representing me in the custody battle, which had been brought by the father of my youngest daughter, the one who said he'd make the rest of my life miserable. I never married him, but he was suing me for common law divorce, palimony, and custody of our daughter on the grounds that I was an unfit mother. So I'm in Jack's office and one of Raymond Jr.'s friends, another alleged organized crime figure, comes running into the office, white face, saying they just arrested Senior and took him to the Situate State Police Barracks. And Junior and Rita are very worried about him because he didn't finish dinner and forgot his nitro and they want one of his doctors to check him and we can't reach any of his doctors. So I said, well, let me try. And so I tried a few numbers that usually only doctors know, and I couldn't reach any of his doctors. And I had already agreed to be his doctor. So, you know, finally I said, all right, look, if you can't, if we can't get anybody else, I'll go check on him. So I'm driven to the Situate State Police Barracks and I'm on the way and I'm thinking, oh my God, what have you gotten yourself into, Barbara? And, um, but, you know, I, as far as I was concerned, I had already accepted this man as my patient. So I'm expecting this very somber, serious gathering of lawyers and law enforcement people, everybody looking you know, like they're at a funeral or something. And I get there and it's like a rowdy tailgate party at a college homecoming weekend. Everybody's laughing and joking and Jack is introducing me to all these people I don't know. This is Dr. Robert, she's Raymond's cardiologist and Raymond's nowhere to be seen. And I don't have a chance to talk to um, Jack privately to see, you know, what's going on. All I knew was that this man had been arrested. So Jack said, Raymond's in uh, Major Benjamin's office. Major Benjamin was second in command of the Rhode Island State Police. And uh, I'm going to go in and tell Raymond that you're going to check him. So he comes out and he takes me to the door, I walk in the room. Now, it wasn't too long after the Godfather movies had premiered. So, you know, what do you think when you think a Don, Mafia Don, you think Marlon Brando, right? And I walk in the room and the first thing I thought when I laid eyes on Raymond was, oh my God, he's so tiny. <laughs> and then I took a better look and I thought, holy shice, this man looks like he's gonna have a cardiac arrest any minute and I'll never be able to resuscitate him here because he was cyanotic. He was sweaty. He was having difficulty breathing. And when I introduced myself and, and took a history, I asked him, have you been having any chest discomfort? And he said, yes. And I said, for how long? And he said, about two hours. 
And I said, did you take nitroglycerin? Because at that point, you know, I wasn't sure, maybe. He said, no, I left it at home. At which point, Major Benjamin pipes up, hey, Doc, he can borrow one of mine. And I said, no, I don't think that's a good idea because I wasn't sure what dose he was on. So I examined him, and then I really became alarmed because his pulse was highly erratic. And an erratic pulse in someone having a prolonged angina attack can be a harbinger of sudden cardiac death. So I said to Major Benjamin, this man has to be admitted to the hospital. Oh, no, 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 he's been arrested on a capital charge. He can't go to the hospital. And I kept insisting. So he said, well, and call Colonel Stone, the head of the Rhode Island State Police, which I did. And Colonel Stone didn't want to hear about it. And I kept insisting. And finally, he said, well, call the state police surgeon. So I called the state police surgeon, told him my history and physical findings. He says, oh, you're absolutely right, Dr. Roberts. This man has to go to the hospital immediately. <laughs> so um, I called Colonel Stone back and he said, well, I want him admitted to Fatima Hospital because that's the only place we can keep him under 24-hour guard. And I had this brainstorm and I said, that's not true, Colonel Stone. I said, remember Anthony Femini? who also was a client of Jack Cicilline's. Anthony Femini, while out on parole, had been shot in the head, rolled up in a rug, and stuffed in the trunk of a car. But he was found and resuscitated, and he was taken to the Miriam Hospital, where he was kept under 24-hour guard. And I reminded Colonel Stone of this, and of course he knew the case. So, so he finally agreed that I could take Raymond to the Miriam Hospital, and that was the beginning of what turned out to be a six-week hospitalization. And within a few days of his admission to hospital, I was publicly identified in the Providence Journal as his cardiologist. And shortly thereafter, I got a call from a, a, a young Italian American that I had briefly dated. And even after we stopped dating, we remained friends. And he called me and he said, Doc, because they all called me Doc, got to tell you a funny story. I said, what? He said, remember so-and-so? I said, yeah, I remember him. He said, he called me and he said, hey, Vinny, remember that doctor broad you used to date? She's the old man's doctor now. <laughs> and I thought that was hilarious because to me, a broad is a woman with large breasts and small frontal lobes. And I, <laughs> and I had just the opposite. At least I'm sure I don't have large breasts. So, um, you know, I didn't take offense. And then about four, about four months later, the Providence Journal, which is, you know, the big newspaper, decided to do a cover article on me in the Sunday Magazine supplement, much to my chagrin because I didn't want the article published, but, uh, you know, I had no control over it. And that Sunday morning, I'm making hospital rounds, and I'm approaching the nurse's station on the fourth floor, and I overhear two nurses, and one says to the other, did you read the article about Dr. Roberts in the paper today? And her friend said, nah, I'm going to wait for the movie. <laughs> and I think that was probably the moment when I started thinking about writing a memoir. Now, within nine months of becoming Raymond's physician, and I was called upon repeatedly to testify about his health, I met and fell in love with the alleged number three man in the New England Mafia. Now, I was single, and one of the disadvantages of being Raymond Sr.'s doctor was it made it hard to get a date. <laughs> <laughs> and I was a randy young woman, I'll admit it. Uh, but when I met Louis Minocchio, you know, he wasn't at all intimidated. You know, he thought I was a heroine for going to bat for Raymond for which I took a tremendous amount of flack in the newspapers, from the police, from the FBI. Um, but to him and to those other wise guys, you know, I was right up there with the Blessed Virgin Mary. I could not, I could not pay a restaurant bill in the Italian section of town the whole time Raymond was alive. So I think I've talked for about a half hour run. And, um, but please read the book because it even gets better and more interesting. <laughs> yeah. 
our Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. And uh, it's always great to bring brilliant sailors to the Yacht Club and occasionally mob mistresses. <laughs> so I asked a question in writing about your talk before you got here. And I said, which oath um, you know, do you prioritize? The Hippocratic Oath or the juror's oath. Talk to me about that issue. As a doctor, you have to keep people alive. Uh, in the judicial system, you have to, um, you know, support justice. Talk to us about that. So when you graduate from medical school, you take the Hippocratic Oath. And central to the Hippocratic Oath are two things. One, I will do no harm, and two, I will put my patient's interests ahead of my own. Not my patients who don't have felony records, not my patients who aren't facing capital charges. Any patient I accept into my care, I will put his or her interests ahead of my own. So I felt that I had a moral obligation to treat Raymond to the best of my ability. Now, people say, well, how could you tell he wasn't faking the angina? Well, on multiple occasions, when he would have an attack of angina, he was hooked up to an EKG. And we could see the characteristic changes in the EKG that occur when someone's heart is starved for oxygen. So I knew he wasn't faking it. In fact, he downplayed his symptoms. You know, he was the Don. He had to project an image of strength. He had hidden pretty much, except from his immediate family, but he had hidden from his associates how very ill he was. He had such severe neuropathy, uh, you know, damage to the nerves from his diabetes, that he couldn't cut his food. Rita had to cut all his food before he could eat. He couldn't button his own shirt. Rita had to dress him. Rita being? His wife. Yeah, Rita O'Toole, patriarcha. And she ruled the roost. Yeah, she, uh, <laughs> so who scared you in those days? Well, certainly none of the wise guys. Um, I, you know, I was nervous about the police. Did she scare you? To protect him. <laughs> <laughs> so his wife and you were in league to protect him. Yes. And she recognized your value. Yes. And supported you in a like. Yes. And so did he. I mean, on multiple occasions, he would tell me how terrible he felt about all the things that happened to me because I went to bed for him. And he would say, I know I owe you my life. I couldn't love you more if you were my own daughter. What was his age difference with you? Well, he was 72 when I met him and I was 36. So 36 years. Uh -huh. And um, how tall was he? He was not as tall as I am, and I'm short. <laughs> you so know, he had shrunk. He was five two, five. Three. Yeah, something like that. So are mobsters good lovers? <laughs> I can only speak to one of them, and yes, he was. Um, <laughs> you know, I want to clarify. Lewis was never married. Wait, that was affirmative. Yeah, Lu yes, yeah. Lewis was never married. So I say mob mistress, mob mistress, because it's more alliterative than saying mob lover. But um, he wasn't married, and I wasn't married. So uh, while you're dating the boss. No, uh, no. number three. No, when you were yeah. dating the boss, oh. then you got an interest in number three. I wasn't dating the boss. I was taking care of the boss. Taking care of the boss. That's I it. was his cardiologist. You were his cardiologist. Yeah. And, and helping him in many ways relax. When you, well, did you keeping pay, him from stress. Keeping him from stress. That's right. Yeah. Right, exactly. And then you paid, what was it about number three that attracted you? Well, as I said, he wasn't intimidated by me at all. He admired me. He was very handsome. He was, he, is, he was just a fascinating man. He had been on the lam for 10 years and had only, been Lewis. Back, Lewis, had only been back in Rhode Island about two years when I met him. And he left after being indicted for the same charge that Raymond was subsequently uh, convicted of and served time for, which was accessory to conspiracy to murder. 
he went on the lam because he didn't think he could get a fair trial. So he was and, he was on the lam at this time. Yes, he was on the FBI's ten most wanted list up until two years before I met him. And during a lot of that time, he was in France, and he was he was really brilliant. If his family could have afforded to send him for schooling, he would have been you know the CEO of some huge company. He taught himself French. He bought a French-English dictionary. He would take the metro to the farthest station. He would walk all the way back, engaging people in conversation and translating the signs. He took up skiing and mountain climbing. And I'll forget he said to me not long after I met him, Barbara, you know, the guys I grew up thinking were heroes, were real tough guys. What I realized when I was in France, mountain climbing, was that those guys were crazy. The real tough guys and the real men were the people I met who were, you know, mountain rescue people. And he, you know, he was pretty closed mouth about his past, but he tried to impress upon me that he was a very different person than the person he was before he went away. And he also denied, you know, that he was an accessory to this murder. He, he proclaimed his innocence to you. Well, he said it, it didn't happen the way they say. No, I'm going to keep asking, it's so much fun, questions of our speaker. But if you have a question, um, uh, Jim Hancock has got the microphone. Jim, if you'll stand over here so people keep reminded about the opportunity to ask a question, just hold up your hand and Jim will bring you the mic. And I'd love to have as many questions from the audience as possible. Um, so what was Ray's diet like? What's the mobster eat? Well, uh, Rita had him on a strict diabetic diet. He okay. did not get any sweets. And he ate basically a Mediterranean style diet. Was there uh, any rivalry between um, number one and number three? Not that I could see. Strict allegiance. Well, Lewis said to me, no one has ever been my boss, nor am I the boss of anybody. So he denied that. That they had a working was... relationship. So what kind of hours does a, does a mobster keep? <laughs> I guess it depends on, you know, <laughs> what you're doing. But Raymond Sr. was basically under house arrest. In fact, when he was finally discharged from the hospital, I decided that instead of having him come to my office, I would make house calls because I thought if, he's, if he starts coming to my office to be checked, they're going to say if he's well enough to travel to her office, he's well enough to travel to court. So I would go uh, once a week and make a house call. And Rita would make lunch for us. And I would, you know, talk to him, take a history, examine him. You know, every couple of months I'd do an EKG. And so we became very close. And as I said, he was extremely grateful for the care I took of him. We have a question. Yes, ma'am. Doctor, what I, I know there are downsides to your relationship with the mob. What are the upsides? Well, let me talk a little bit about the downside. You know, we, Lewis and I had to keep our relationship as a, as a tight secret because the credibility of my testimony about Raymond's health would have been severely impacted, if not destroyed, if it became known that I was romantically involved with an alleged organized crime figure. So the, 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 nobody knew that Lewis and I were romantically involved. He was managing a restaurant at the time, and I would go there often with my children have dinner, um, but we never walked down the street holding hands or anything. And I went sailing with him a few times. He actually bought a hair shop. He took up sailing. A and sailing hair shop. He, he bought a sailboat from Halsey Hair Shop himself. And um, wow. he tells the story, and I had to laugh. He said something like, um, I really want to, what is it? I really want to, I think he said, I really want to learn that ecclesiastical navigation, meaning celestial <laughs> navigation. Ecclesi ecclesiastical. And all, you know, the guy looked at him as if he was some lower life form. <laughs> <laughs> that, that too. Yeah, but he became a, a decent sailor, although he didn't race. Dr. Joe Fink has a question. Joe. Barbara, uh, it's kind of two-part, but related. Were you ever worried about physical danger? And to the extreme, were you ever worried about actual extermination. I wasn't worried about physical danger from mobsters, and I really didn't think the police would, you know. Rub you out? Rub me out. <laughs> Read the book. There, there was an instance when I was physically attacked, but I don't want to give it away. 
You want to buy the book? I want, them to buy, I want you to buy the book or read the book. Get it from the library if you can't afford it. Um, but um, so I didn't feel threatened in that respect. And did I feel, what was the second part of the question? Extermination. Uh, Getting killed. No. Well, we were, we were sitting here at lunch. There was a mug shot up there of you. What mm -hmm. was that all about? Yeah. I was, um, you know, the father of my youngest child, whose name was Ned. When I broke up with Ned, it was before I became Raymond's doctor. And he would call the police on multiple occasions and accuse me of, uh, of beating him up or assaulting <clears throat> him. And the first couple of times the police came to my door and I would say, look at me. You know, I'm 5'4", <laughs> I weigh in at about, you know, 107 pounds. He's 6'2 and 190. Who do you think is, you know, assaulting who? So they eventually stopped, you know, coming to my house. He would call the Department of Children, Youth, and Their Families and accuse me of, you know, abusing and neglecting the children. He would put my home phone number up on the, you know, men's room wall in bars and you know people would call me in the middle of the night he would come to the hospital and harass me so it was a real campaign of harassment but the police finally stopped paying him any attention until i became raymond's doctor and then there was one weekend when he had visitation of our four-year-old daughter when she called me hysterical screaming mommy come get me mommy come get me and as i said he had a lot of drug and alcohol problems and so i went rushing over there with my then boyfriend, it was before Lewis, and we <laughs> rescued her. Didn't lay a hand on Ned. Ned was never touched, um, but he called the police and the police came to my house and I told them what happened. And that Monday, I think it was the next day, I was in family court trying to get his uh, visitation ended when I got a call from Jack Cicilline's secretary, Barbara, wherever you are, you gotta hide. There's a warrant out for your arrest. I said, you know, you know, I'm in family court. I'm really easy to find. <laughs> so uh, the bailiff is near. Yeah. So, so you know, I told the associate that you know the police there's a warrant out for my arrest. So he arranged to um, surrender me. So I was mugged, booked, and fingerprinted on a felony, breaking an entry, daylight, occupied dwelling five to seven years if convicted. Okay, so now- the, And that was in the paper, of course. The, the Providence cardiologist, patriarch's physician, you know, arrested, blah, blah, blah. The, the adventure's been going so fast, I've kind of lost track for a second now. So now you were not Raymond Patriarca's lover. No. Just Louis Lark, just for the record. Just Louis Minocchio's lover, just Louis. yes. And during that period, the uh, ex-boyfriend who was the father of one of your children, when he was bugging you, intimidating you, were you ever confessed to us a little bit, you know, tempted to say, boys, this guy's giving me a little trouble? No. In fact, I said just the opposite, because everybody knew about it. I said, no one is to lay a hand on Ned. And the, the FBI came to my office one day, and they were basically, the gist of the visit was, if anything happens to this guy, you're in big trouble. I said, you know, you guys really pissed me off. I said, I came to your attention during the anti-war movement because I'm unalterably opposed to any form of violence. Plus, I'm pretty smart. Don't you think I know that if anything happened to Ned, even if I could prove I was on the moon at the time, I wouldn't be the number one, you know, suspect. That's who I'd suspect. <laughs> <laughs> so no, nothing, you know, nothing about So it. were you worried? I mean, I've seen the movie. I saw Marlon Brando. Were you ever worried when you were in a restaurant with him, you know, that you'd go like this and be misinterpreted? Would he? We only ate at a restaurant once. You were undercover when you were with him. It was it was the winter. I think it was the first winter I was taking care of him, and he was very very depressed. And you know he was basically under twenty four hour house arrest. So, and I had started taking my youngest daughter on the house calls. And Ray, uh, Raymond loved Megan, my my youngest, and Megan loved him. She called him Uncle Raymond, because as we were leaving, he he got in the habit of slipping her a twenty dollar bill and saying, "Take your mother someplace nice." So after a, after a while, when we got up to leave, she'd walk over to him with her hand out. <laughs> so um, Raymond, Rita, his daughter-in-law, Barbara, Megan, and I went out to dinner at the Coast Guard house, which is right on the, right on the ocean in Narragansett, um, and had 
dinner one Sunday in the winter. That was the only time I have a at a restaurant with Raymond Sr., but I had lunch with him every week at his house. Now, though he's not a member of the mob, he is a friend of mine. Don Weineke has a question. Don. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara, yeah, I think I've got the question that everybody wants to know. Uh, are you now or did you ever carry a gun? <laughs> And if so, who gave it to you? Um, I was actually given a gun by the lawyer who ultimately defended me in the custody trial. His name was Al Lepore. And he gave me a gun, which I never shot. But years later, I had a friend who was into target practice, and I shot a gun a few times with him at target practice. Cool, yeah. Hang on one second. I got one more question. So we, we all know about this from The Sopranos. In The Sopranos, there was a Dr. Malfi some 50, 60 years later. Yes. So how often when you watch The Sopranos did you feel the involvement with uh, Dr. Malfi? And uh, what did you think? I thought I should be getting royalties. <laughs> Actually, Robin Green... If you look at the credits, Robin Green was one of the co-executive producers and one of the writers on The Sopranos. Robin Green grew up in Providence, and she and her boyfriend used to double date with Raymond Jr. and his girlfriend in high school. So she would she knew about Raymond Sr.'s home life. At that time, Raymond's first wife was still alive, Helen, it was before she died of cancer. So Robin Green had a really good understanding of the home life of these uh, mobsters and I became totally hooked because it was the most realistic thing I had ever seen about the home <laughs> life of mobsters. Most of them uh, didn't say boo to their wives. Now they had mistresses, they called them kumaras, which is the Neapolitan dialect for godmother, but you know, those were two separate worlds. So the chairperson for the San Francisco Yacht Club speaking series has a question. Mo Rani, your question. So it's not a question. I know all these great stories. I wanted to tell one. Um, <laughs> you asked about one of the benefits of being the mom. Um, would you tell a story about your ratty coat? Oh, yeah. <laughs> when I, so I started taking care of Raymond on December 4th, 1980. And that's easy to remember because December 4th was the Feast of St. Barbara my patron saint, before she became desainted. And St. Barbara was the patron saint of earthquakes, tropical storms, and artillery gunners. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I had this quilted, you know, olive green coat that I used to wear. And, you know, my friend, the cardiac surgeon, Bob and Delia, and his friend, the mob lawyer, Jack Cicilline, would love to go out and eat at all these great Italian restaurants in Providence. And I would go... Um, with them, and uh, a few days before Christmas, the secretary in Jack's office called me and said, uh, can you come up after office hours? Jack wants to have a meeting with you. So I said, sure. So I go up to Jack's office, and Junior's there, and Jack's there, and there's a huge red gift box with a huge white ribbon around it, and Junior says, Merry Christmas for me and my father. Why don't you open it? So I opened it, and it was a full-length black glamour mink coat <laughs> <laughs> with my name embroidered in the uh, in the lining. It, I I said, oh, does this? And, and they had the ad campaign. Uh, this something becomes a legend most. I said, does this mean I'm becoming a, a legend? They said, no, we're just ashamed to be seen with you in that ratty green coat. <laughs> <laughs> So, so we knew about Machine Gun Kelly and Louis the Lip. What was uh, Ray's uh, nickname, his mob name? Well, he had several. They called him the Old Man. They called him Cigar because he used to smoke cigars. And uh, he used to be called George. I'm not sure why. Lewis, is, Lewis was actually Baby Shacks. Baby Shacks was his but, name. Well, that, there's a whole story there. He was called Baby Shacks because in his youth he had a very baby face and because he was very, um, shall we say, lucky with the ladies. He shacked up with a lot of women. <laughs> and then on one of his uh, arrest forms, the cop made a typographical error. Instead of typing Baby Shacks, he typed Baby Shanks. Oh. So then, and I didn't know which was correct until Crime Town, the podcast. Any of you listen to the... Crime Town podcast. Well, 
this was a very popular podcast that came out in the fall of 2016. And the se season one examined the intersection of the mafia and politics in Rhode Island. And through the Crime Town, we put on several live events. <clears throat> through Crime Town, I got to meet a retired state police captain by the name of Brian Andrews. And he told me the real story. It's really Baby Shacks not Baby Shanks. So if Baby Shacks was his nickname to the mob, did you have a nickname for him too? I called my wife Barbie Kids. What was his nickname in your eyes? I just called him Lewis. <laughs> Lewis. Did he, have a, did he have a sweet term for you? No. I mean, you're there pillow to pillow. What does he say? What does he call you? Barbie? Barbara? No, Barbara. Barbara? <laughs> okay, Gordon, and then we have a question over here. Gordon? Uh, hi. Uh, the question that comes to mind is, what effect did this have on your medical practice? It, it had to have had an effect, well, and it must have been yeah. rather interesting. Yeah, well, you know, there were some doctors who stopped referring me patients because of my notoriety, but I think it was more than made up for by the patients who came to me on their own. And I, I believe their thinking was, well, Raymond can afford the best. If he's, if he's going to her, she must be the best, and I want to go to her also. And, you know, I, so I wound up taking care of just about all the wise guys who had heart conditions. <laughs> Lynn, I don't, the question? I, I don't know when I've had so much fun. You're absolutely <laughs> wonderful. Just such, <laughs> you have guts and you're intelligent and you take chances and you live by what you believe. And I really admire you for that. Thank you. Lynn. <laughs> I always say I moved to Rhode Island and I've never been bored. <laughs> <laughs> we have another question. Hi, I'm wondering, uh, you had your, you came from a large family and did you hear from your family when you were going through this? Did anybody have any comments to you? I know you're yes. your own woman and it yes. doesn't matter, but on the other hand, there is family. Yeah, no, my family were wonderful. They were wonderful. They were very supportive. In fact, they loved Lewis. Uh, of all the men I had ever been involved with, I think he may still be their favorite. Just with he was so good to me. Now, was he active mob while you were dating? No, he was out on parole. I mean, he was. Um, he was a lamb. I know that. <laughs> he negotiated a deal because by the time he came back, the only witness. Wait, he was on the lamb. Then he, was he came on the back. His lawyer negotiated a deal in which he would surrender and be released on bond pending trial. But the only witness against him, who was a, a famous thief by the name of Red Kelly, by then had developed early Alzheimer's. So no one expected he would ever go to trial. So Lewis was out, you know. So he was free to walk around? And yes. He, I, I don't think he was free to leave the country, but he was free to walk around, yes. We have another question. Uh, microphone? Yeah, I, I was wondering... Uh the HBO series, The Sopranos, that's pretty accurate then? As far as their home life, yes. I mean, most of the guys I knew, um, the ones who were, who were married and parents, were devoted parents. They didn't want their kids in the mob. The number two alleged organized crime, crime figure, this guy named Nicky Bianco, and he was married to this beautiful woman, Francesca, and they had three children. And uh, his son is now a very successful real estate lawyer in Miami. And his daughters, you know, are in business. But they did not want their kids in the life. The life. So is uh, politics in Rhode Island, are they still about the same then? <laughs> well, the, the mafia is pretty much dead, at least the Italian mafia. Um, it's still corrupt. Yeah. <laughs> Let's show me a place that isn't. <laughs> so now mobsters, um, you know, mob people, beat people up and stuff like that. When you were the lover of a mobster, how was he to be around? Was he ever rough? Oh, no. In fact, <laughs> he was, you know, he said, I would never, ever raise my hand to a woman. I wouldn't give her the satisfaction of knowing she had made me lose control. Ah. Microphone. But in, no, he was, he was, you know, with me, he was a very gentle, kind, generous, loving person. I mean, he called me every day. 
you know, we got when he was in town, we saw each other just about every day. He was always giving me presents, but not, you know, the typical presents you think of. He was giving me things like Will and Ariel Durant's multi-volume history of civilization. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, lamps, uh, you know, other books, the Decameron. You know, he, he was an autodidact. He loved to read and he knew I loved to read. So um, how bright was Ray compared to Lou? See if that's working. Ray, Ray, Raymond Sr.? Yes, Raymond Sr. When I met him, he was, you know, very, very ill. You know, and as I said, I testified in multiple courts in multiple states about how, in my opinion, putting him on trial would kill him. And the state and federal prosecutors hired multiple other cardiologists to try and refute what I said. Not one of them did. But I'll never forget, one day I was in court, and it was a female prosecutor. Her name was Sue McGurl, and I'll never forget, she kept asking me the same question, but phrasing it slightly differently. And the gist of the question was, if this guy's as sick as you say he is, how come he's still alive? <laughs> and finally I lost it, and I said, you know what? Only God, in her wisdom, knows when anyone's going to die. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, everybody burst out laughing, except the judge. The question from Joe Fink. Yeah, Barbara, I don't know whether this time sequence works, but there was a mayor in Providence named Buddy something. Buddy Cianci, Who was yes. corrupt and in oh, and out of jail oh. and reelected. Yeah. What's your what's your knowledge of him and were well, you personally I, involved with him? I wasn't personally involved with him, although um, my husband did a portrait of him, a, a photographic portrait. Buddy was, in my opinion, a horrible person. He was a wife abuser. His ex-wife, Sheila Bentley, and I have been good friends. We bonded in the 1980s over both being infamous Rhode Island women. This was after her divorce from Buddy. And, and they just there was a book written about Buddy called The Prince of Providence by a guy named Mike Stanton. They've just made it into a musical, and it played to sold-out performances at Trinity Square Repertory Company. Uh, and for the first time, Sheila Cianci has spoken in public about the fact that she was a, a victim of spousal abuse. So, she had she had to appear at a, at a one of his uh, he was running for real office and she had to use heavy makeup to hide the black eye he gave her. Uh, almost thirty years off and on. So Barbara, so I'm holding the book up right now. Um, the book the, the conversation is fascinating. I bet the book is fascinating. Is there a movie? Well, um, I have had some interest from three different Hollywood production companies, but nobody's made me an offer I can't refuse. <laughs> <laughs> and I always say, you know, if it happens, these things can take many, many years. So if it happens, I hope I'm still alive, and I want to have a cameo performance as an elderly nun. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Staff Commodore Bruce Monroe's questions. So, Barbara, you obviously had a very interesting and unusual medical practice. How did you get paid? Insurance and Medicare and checks. From the. Oh, you mean how did Raymond? How did Raymond? Pay? No, no. How Raymond did, had Medicare. How did you get paid as the doctor to the wise guys? I would, when I made a house call, I would tell my secretary. I made a house call. She would submit the bill to Medicare, and I would, you know, get paid. So we paid Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, so, but not everybody was on Medicare, sure, surely. Did you well, have you any know, younger? I was, a, I was a cardiologist, so most of my patients were elderly. Um, I have to tell you one other story about one of my wise guy patients. He was, this is long after Raymond died, but he was in prison for murder, which he actually didn't commit. His brother was guilty, but he wasn't. Anyway. <laughs> Details. Uh, yeah. Details. So he was serving a life sentence, and he became morbidly obese in prison and developed heart disease. And somehow or other, he convinced the prison authorities to let him come to see me as his cardiologist. So here's this guy. He shows up for his first office visit with two rifle-toting guards. And he's got chains on his legs and chains on his hands. And here's, you know, my my waiting room, and everybody's sitting there. <laughs> <you know. laughs> so I brought him into my office. I took his history. Then I 
with the guards. Then I took them, all three of them, into the exam room, and I said to the guards, take his chains off so I can get an accurate weight. And they looked at me like, are you out of your mind? And I'm, I looked at them. And then they realized, you know, this guy is an a organized crime figure. He's not going to do anything to get this doctor in trouble. So they take his chains off, and I weigh him. He's over 300 pounds. And I say, all right, now get undressed from the waist up, hop up on the exam table, and I'll be back in a few minutes. So I come back in, and I'm listening, you know, I'm listening to his lungs, and I listen to his heart. And then I said, now lie down so I can examine your stomach. And he had this enormous stomach. And on his stomach, he had an enormous tattoo. And what was the tattoo of? The pink panther with a massive erection. <laughs> so, so I'm like biting the inside of my cheek so I don't burst out laughing. And then my poor little medical assistant goes in to do his EKG, and she comes out, and she's like, beat red. <laughs> How, show us how big was his stomach. Enormous. He looked like he was carrying troopers. <laughs> so now, what percent of your practice were mobsters? Well, you know, At the height I of your never, career. I never told you about that. A surprising number of them were also law enforcement officials. So sometimes my waiting, my waiting room would look like a mini Appalachian. You know that famous mob meeting in upstate New York in the 1950s? There'd be all the mobsters and all the cops and then a bunch of little old men and ladies. <laughs> so was it ever a, a third of your practice, a half of your practice? No, no. There weren't 10%. that many of them. There weren't that many of them. And they didn't live that long. And, you know, right. right. Well, I, you know, the young guys didn't have heart disease. So did any of, of your clients get shot or die or have anything happen while you were tending to them? She's thinking. I'm thinking. No. Um, how are they as a pay? Do they pay fast? Pay well? First of all, they're very compliant patients. And it's funny because you think of the mafia as being this patriarchal, misogynistic institution. But they had no trouble accepting me as their cardiologist. And they, they would do what I told them. And, you know, most of them had Medicare, as I said. So, yeah, I got paid. Any more questions from the audience? So, Barbara. Wait, wait, microphone. Eula. Eula Lavecki has a question. Eula. Um, hi. Hi. Going back to the tattoo, I would think uh, maybe a mop. Uh, you know, mop, cleaning mop. So that brings me to another question. What's the, in your opinion, definition between a mop and a mob? The difference between a mop and a mob? The difference between a P and a B. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, Barbara, um, talk to us a little bit about the writing process. So you have this incredibly colorful life. You decide that you want to write. This is your fourth book, as I understand it. And so what is your process? Do you write from a certain time of day? Talk to us. Yeah. Well, you know, um, about eight years after Raymond died, I was in solo private practice. And I was approached by someone I'd known for many years who had, was the former chief of cardiology at my hospital. He had gone into private practice. And his two partners had left him because he was a very difficult person to get along with. And anyway, he asked if I would join him. And he was a very good businessman. And we wound up having the largest private practice in the state of Rhode Island. But after almost eight years, I realized I either had to kill him or leave the practice. And I'm nonviolent, even though I thought I could get away with it on the grounds of justifiable homicide. But um, I decided that I would leave the practice, and there was a two-year non-compete clause. So he had to pay me to stay home for two years and not practice anywhere in Rhode Island. So I had been thinking about writing a memoir for a while, since, you know, probably 1981. So the year 2000, I'm on what I consider a sabbatical, and I started writing the book. And I wrote five days a week, a minimum of you know four to six hours a day for six months 
And when I finished the first draft, I burst into tears. And I don't cry easily because it was a very cathartic experience to write through all of these traumatic things that had happened to me in the course of my life. But, you know, it was almost 600 pages long. And I knew I didn't want to have it published while I was still seeing patients. I didn't want to be sitting across the desk from particularly a new patient and having them distracted by thinking about my lurid past when I'm trying to get a history from them so I can take care of them. But I knew that once I retired, I would try to have it published and I knew I would have to rewrite it. So fast forward to Crime Town, that podcast I mentioned, which I, you know, ultimately agreed to participate in. That was the first time I spoke publicly about this because in the back of my mind, I thought, you know, if this podcast does well, that'll help me get an agent. By then I had had three books published, but they were all medical books with, you know, directed at a lay audience. And I didn't think, I, the book I wrote before the doctor wrote was called The Truth About Statins. And it was published by Simon and & Schuster. And I didn't think the agent I had for that book was the right agent for this book. So I knew I'd be looking for an agent. And I started thinking if Crime Town does well, and it has been downloaded over 50 million times, 50 million, that that would help me get an agent. And it did because the agent came looking for me because he was a big Crime Town fan. And he heard from a mutual acquaintance that I had written a memoir. So how many uh, um, mobsters, wise guys, did you ultimately get to have conversations and get to, to know that? Oh, I'd say half a dozen. So what's common to them? Is there something different about them versus the average person who drives a station wagon in the garage? Well, yeah, they have a whole whole different moral code, or you might call it an immoral code, but they live by a code. It's just a code that we would find, you know, you know. Describe their code. Well, you're, you are in a family, family being, you know, La Cosa Nostra, whatever you want to call it, and your allegiance is to that family. Okay, so we're many of us are in oral, all in families. We have allegiance to our family. What's the difference between them having allegiance? Their families are involved in crime. Their families are in crime. What on earth is happening? So, yeah, so. So, you know, their family is um, making money in criminal enterprises, and your family hopefully isn't. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, don't, don't tell anyone. <laughs> so, how smart are wise guys? Some of them are very smart. Like Lewis was very smart. Um, Ray, by the time I met Raymond, he was so debilitated. It was hard to tell how smart he was, but he was certainly, you know, he had survived in that atmosphere for decades. So I don't think he was a dummy. So are these guys scared because of the world that they're in generally? Do they I worry about being assassinated? Well, if they did, they didn't tell me. You know, they were very careful about what they would say in front of me. You know, they didn't want to get me in trouble. And I, I, didn't, I didn't really care whether Raymond was innocent or guilty of the charges he was facing. That wasn't my job. My job wasn't to be his judge. My job wasn't to be his jury. My job was to be his physician and to treat his heart disease to the best of my ability. <laughs> And we should say with that, it has been incredibly fun to have you as a guest on the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Our guest, Barbara Roberts, thank you so much. Her book is a terrific book. you got to buy one of these. Thank you very much. And with that, the meeting, our luncheon, is adjourned. Thank you all. You're a great audience. Wonderful. Wonderful. Oh, it's so much fun. So much fun. Thank <laughs> you.